a time that's to facilitate the restoration and relocation of this important piece of work. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's now a pleasure to introduce uh, Lord Hennessy. Peter, I find I swept up your notes with mine last time, so I promise when I sit down next, I will leave yours here. <laughs> uh, Peter Hennessy has had a distinguished career as a journalist and as a political commentator. Uh, to our great pleasure and great benefit, he has been associated with Queen Mary since 1992, since 2001, as Attlee Professor of Contemporary British History. He was elevated to the peerage in 2010 as Baron Hennessy of Nimsfield. Peter will initially present 10 students with the Abney Prize for Outstanding Academic Attainment, and then we'll deliver his lecture entitled The Incomparable Play. Peter. Thank you, Principal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Indeed, the other Peter will present the prizes. I'm just Master of Ceremonies. The Attlee Prize is given to those students that get first on our Cabinet and Premiership course in the School of History. It's a tough course, I like to think it's the toughest there is, so these ladies and gentlemen are the real stars, not just of the future, but of now. And I'll call them up in the order I have them down here. Rasheen? Yes, sir. You're in the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> Peacock. And Matthew Jackson. Thank you very much, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and an honour to be able to speak this evening subject of my one political hero. Clement Attlee's been on my mind a good deal of late, not just in anticipation of this evening's splendid occasion, for which I thank Peter very much for coming. For example, watching the King's speech left me regretting that the story stopped in 1940. I dearly wish it had stretched to Mr. Attlee's post-war premiership. Just think what the film's scriptwriter and director could have squeezed out of the weekly audiences when the Prime Minister called on King George VI for a chat and a fan. <laughs> the occasions formerly known 
as the head of state receiving his head of government. Mm -hmm. Let the incomparable Ken tell the story in his own words. Reading the lives of my predecessors, I've often thought of how fortunate I was to have uh, had to deal with George VI and not with a George IV or even Queen Victoria. I'm struck by the difference between the stiffness and formality of the past and the ease of the present. Now, I gather that Queen Victoria expected her Prime Minister to stand during an audience, whereas now he comes in and is invited to sit down and have a cigarette. This is Clem and George VI, not Dame and Elizabeth II. <laughs> the conversation, too, was, I think, said Clem, very formal. Queen Victoria may have unbent a bit to Dizzy, but not to Gladstone. I can't imagine her saying to Lord Salisbury, for instance, how's Joe getting on with the colonies? But it would be quite natural for George VI to say to me, how's Manny, that shoe well? How's Manny hitting it off with the French generals? Or, well, Nye, that's Bevan, seems to be getting the doctors in line. I, on the other hand, might have said to the king, the old man, that's Churchill, the old man was really rather naughty in the house about India yesterday. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, was positively grade one listed banter compared to their initial encounter as Sovereign and Prime Minister on the evening of the 26th of July, 1945, just a few hours after Mr. Attlee, as the Principal said in his count in our own people's palace, first realised he was on the way to number 10. Mrs. Attlee drove her husband to Buckingham Palace shortly after 7 that evening, once Churchill had tendered his resignation to the monarch. According to number 10 legend, the King and Mr. Attlee, who had come to know each other well enough during the war, were temporarily overcome by the natural shyness they shared. Athley finally broke the silence by saying, I've won the election. <laughs> <laughs> to which his sovereign replied, I know, I hoped on the six o'clock news. <laughs> British constitutional practice changed that evening. Ever since then, the Downing Street and Palace private offices have prepared so-called audience notes, lest the monarch and the prime minister require a prompt. <coughs> As you all know, brevity was an athlete hallmark. As Douglas Jay, who was his economic advisor in number 10 in 1945, for said of his boss, he would never use one syllable where none would do. <laughs> Yet in terseness there lay wisdom. Athlete could make a very few words go a long way. Another reason he's been on my mind lately is a recent conversation I had with Lord McNally, Deputy Leader of the House of Lords, about the occasion in 1963 when Tom, as a student at University College London, invited Lord Attlee to speak to the students. He told me that the first thing, uh, the Attlees were late, and Mrs Attlee comes in and says to Tom, how long has Tottenham Court Road been a one-way system? <laughs> <laughs> this being the CL, of course, down the road. And it was then that Simon's already quoted it that Tom McNally said, Lord Ashley, what made you a socialist? Limehouse, the one word, the experience of being a social worker in the East End. And then Tom said, Lord Ashley, what's the greatest gift of the British political tradition to the world? Tolerance. One word. As for the Ashley character sketches, he turned minuscule, not just mini biography, into an art form. Here he is on Lord Halifax, the Foreign Secretary when war broke out in September 1939. Queer bird Halifax, very humorous, all hunting and holy communion. <laughs> <laughs> and on Winston Churchill, it was poetry coupled with energy that did the trick. History set in the job that he was the ideal man to do. And as for autobiography, this is unsurpassable. Listen to Atley's reply to his official biographer, Kenneth Harris, when Ken asked him if he was a Christian. Believe in the ethics, can't believe in the mumbo jumbo. <laughs> Nobody, but nobody distilled character, conviction, and politics better. I thought of the incomparable Clem a good deal last year, too, especially during those for us novel leaders' debates in the run up to the May 2010 general election. I tried to imagine such a thing in 1945, 1950, or 1951. Both Ackley and Churchill, in their different ways, were absolutely hopeless on television. Can you visualize them head to head? Churchill would have addressed the camera as if it was some vast public meeting with all the gestures. And the grandiloquence would have sounded hugely overwhelmed. <coughs> Attlee would have been so terse that the questions would have run out, as they tended to do on his occasional and hugely unrevealing meetings with the Westminster political correspondents. I can give you an idea of Attlee under questioning by reciting the transcript of a newsreel interview shortly after the 1951 general election had been announced. 
Interviewer. Tell us something on how you view the election prospects. Actually. Oh, well, we shall go with a good fight. Very good. Very good chance of winning if we go incompetently. We, we go incompetently, I beg your pardon. We always do. Interviewer. Increasingly desperate. On what will Labour take its stand? Actually. Well, that's something which you'll be announcing shortly. <laughs> Interviewer. Increasingly desperate. Totally desperate. What are your immediate plans, Mr. Atkin? Actually, my immediate plans are to go down to a committee to decide on just that thing as soon as I can get away from here. <laughs> <laughs> Interviewer in extremis. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the coming election? Actually, no. <laughs> Unforgettable and utterly unimaginable today. Propagandist Clem was not. He was a stranger to the soundbite or the well-rehearsed spontaneity, and therefore entirely unsuited to televised hustings of any kind. Part of me, I have to say, was very much in favour of those pre-election debates last year, as they seemed to quicken the curiosity of the 18 to 35 age group, which is the cohort least likely to vote. Another part of me was anxious, because henceforth, when parties choose their leaders, high among the considerations will be how the candidates will perform in those pre-election debates. And the primary skills needed to shine on those rostrums are those of the plausible tunt, not the characteristics required for the long, hard slog of premiership in stretching times. The leaders' debates will, I fear, prevent some very substantial people from acquiring a party leadership, and hence a crack at number 10. In fact, even by the standards of a long past political age, Attlee was an accidental party leader. When Ernie Bevin demolished the saintly George Lansbury's pacifistic leadership during the 1935 Labour Party conference, Attlee was chosen as an interim leader to get the party through the imminent general election from a tiny parliamentary Labour Party of a mere 45 MPs after the 1931 wipeout. And big figures such as Herbert Morrison, Peter's grandfather, were expected to return to the House of Commons at the coming election, and they duly did. A decade later, Herbert Morrison famously tried to get the leadership question reopened on the 26th of July 1945, before Attlee called on the King, but only Bevy, who couldn't abide Peter's grandfather, was having none of it. And in one of those great alleged one-liners of 20th century British politics, I'll explain why it's alleged in a minute, Ernie is supposed to have said on hearing a Labour colleague opine that the trouble with Herbert is in his own worst enemy. Quick as a flash, not what I'm ideating. <laughs> academic politics. <laughs> I say alleged because sometimes it's claimed that Ernie Bevin directed that bar at Nye Bevin, who he couldn't stand either. <laughs> Attlee was the stopgap who stayed serving as Deputy Prime Minister of the Wartime Coalition. He was Prime Minister for six and a quarter years and Labour leader for 20. In doing so, he set, I think, the gold standard for the conduct of the Premiership and for standards of duty and decency at the top for all subsequent Prime Ministers. In personal terms, he was far too modest to allude to this during the Downing Street years or afterwards. Amongst the fascinating collection of Clem's journalism, gathered by Frank Field in his Atlee's Great Contemporaries, one, however, finds a clue. It lurks in the article Lord Atlee penned for the Observer in early 1960 on the theme of what sort of man gets to the top. I've often been asked, he wrote, what it is that makes a Member of Parliament respected. I would say it is very simple. A man has to know his stuff. He mustn't talk too much. He must be good-tempered, not conceited, and be known to be a decent chap. Later in the same piece, he suggested, just as a man cannot be a leader for long if he's not trusted, he cannot be a leader for long if he cannot trust. The only kind of authority worth having is what is given without being sought for. He went on, men who lobby their way forward into leadership are the most likely to be lobbied back out of it. That's a great line. <laughs> the man who has most control of his followers is the man who shows no fear. And a man cannot be a leader if he is afraid of losing his job. Great stuff. That, I suspect, was about as close as Clem Attlee <coughs> ever came to describing the stars of behaviour he steered by as leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister. To our eyes, attuned as they are to the age of the professional politician, the lifers who pursued no other trade, who have, in the saddest and tragic case of Gordon Brown, 
converted every particle of energy since late boyhood into asphalt that would pave his road to number 10. To our eyes and ears, that passage of Atlee's might sound thoroughly honourable, but way out on the rim of political naivety. More's the pity for us and for the political generations to come if a high sense of duty, a strong charge of self-effacement, and an instinct for near silence are records of the potential to rise in our parliamentary and governing system. Yet I must admit, it's hard to see a Clem Attlee being selected to fight a losable seat today, let alone a winnable one. But as I wrote in the afterword to Frank Fields, Attlee's great contemporaries, I remain convinced that if by some benign fluke, a decent, modest, understated figure did reach the top of a party today, great political advantage would accrue to him or her. <coughs> However, when I'm canvassed, as I am now and again, to contribute a vote to those league tables, who are the best or worst prime ministers of the 20th century, I'm reluctant to take part. Now, why is that? Because the conditions the men and one woman faced were so different when they entered number 10. The fluctuations of the political, economic, and global weather so capriciously variable while they were there. What was Clem Attlee's inheritance? <coughs> the hand that history, to his great surprise, dealt him in the People's Palace just across the road, just across the campus, alongside the Mile End Road, on the 26th of July, 1945. The country had lost a third of its wealth in with its allies, licking Hitler and the Axis powers. As Keynes said of our standing alone period in 1940-41, we threw good housekeeping to the winds, but we saved ourselves and helped save the world. I'm absolutely convinced, I always have been, that no superpower threw in its hand to greater effect than we did in 1940-41. The task of demobilising 10 million men and women from the armed forces and the related civil defence services, finding a high proportion of them employment and homes with so many houses and factories rubbled, was always enormously stretching. Handling an eye-watering range of international responsibilities as one of the victorious powers, while sustaining a huge territorial global empire of what are now 40 independent countries, while steering the biggest, India, into India and Pakistan, with the inevitable blood-stained wrenching involved. Finding the money for, by the standards of the past, an ambitious and generous universal welfare system based on the wartime beverage report, <coughs> providing both the funds and the systems for shifting 2.3 million members of the workforce from the private sector into the new nationalised public corporations, the task led by Peter's grandfather, who was a natural formidable organiser. Creating in the National Health Service what Shirley Williams last month called the most trusted piece of our public services and public sector, with a workforce still today third in the world in size after China's Red Army and Indian State Railways. And here Clem Attlee backed by Bevan rather than Herbert Morrison in the great cabinet debate on the configuration of the NHS in 1946 when the draft legislation was being prepared. And as a result on vesting day the 5th of July 1948, the exact anniversary, three years of the voting in 45, because there were three weeks to count the service vote, hence the declaration here on the 26th of July. But the vesting day was the 5th of July 1948. NHS hospitals were combined into a single hospital service, rather than a patchwork in which the local authorities, dear to Herbert Morrison's heart, continued to run a sizable proportion. On top of all these demands, on the depleted financial and physical capacity of the UK, Attlee had eventually to rearm against the Soviet Union and its allies as the Cold War chilled, and to oversee the construction of a considerable Cold War secret state here at home. All this produced a continuous economic and financial overstretch, the ebbs and flows of which sometimes baffled Attlee, who as his young president of the Board of Trade, Harold Wilson later said, was tone deaf on economics. <laughs> In fact, the whole hugely ambitious programme both the anticipated and the unanticipated risks, would have been impossible to sustain without the dollar lifeline provided by the United States, first by the so-called American loan, and later through Marshall aid. We see the current conservative liberal democrat coalition governing in tough financial times while reforming public provision ambitiously and trying to build a big society. 
How, in, how instructive it is to compare what ACME called this tremendous social experiment of 45 to 51 with what is unfolding now. May I turn now, ladies and gentlemen, to the human side of his 1945 inheritance. The British people were exhausted, relieved and proud to have come through the war, attuned both to the collective provision the war had made necessary, and optimistic for the most part about what collective provision could deliver in the peace. The state, unusually for the UK, was albeit grudgingly held in some regard as a provider in hard times and a fashioner of blueprints from above in planning for post-war reconstruction. What of the emotional geography inside the cabinet room? Ackley kept apart the two big figures and the two chief dislikers of each other, Ernie Bevin and Herbert Morrison, in portfolio terms. Bevin at the Foreign Office and Morrison as overlord of the Home Front as Lord President of the Council. And in cabinet meetings, Ackley adopted a similar route. He, Clem, would open very briefly, and unlike, say, Mrs Thatcher, he would not declare what he wished the outcome of the discussion to be by summing up before the debate had started. <laughs> <laughs> Morrison would speak next, and only after everyone else had finished would Ernie Bevin be invited to weigh in. Giles Radici, I'm glad to see is with us this evening, is right in his fine study of that government, the tortoise and the hares, to argue that only Clem Attlee could have handled those tremendous competing egos, temperaments, and personal insecurities that swirled among the likes of Bevin, Morrison, Dalton, Bevan, and Cripps. The tensions were real and ever-present, but there was no truly damaging eruption till the spring of 1951, when, with Attlee in hospital, Gateskill's Korean War-shaped rearmament budget, which involved prescription charges for teeth and spectacles, led to the resignations of Bevan Wilson and John Freeman, and carved the Bevanite flit, split, which divided Labour for much of the 1950s. Dennis Healy, the another, man, another great incomparable figure, Dennis was here uh, to talk to the Mylane group in January, and he repeated his view a few months ago, that by 1951, I'd be interested in Peter's view of this, Labour had finished the business that all sections of the party were agreed upon, which was the implementation of the beverage report, and were vulnerable to splits thereafter. This centrifugal tendency in his party caused Attlee considerable trouble in his last four years as Labour leader. Jim Callaghan once said, the secret of Attlee's success is that he never pretended to be anything other than himself, so he won the confidence of them all without ever becoming a faction fighter. But this understated magic of Clem Attlee ceased to work after the 1951 defeat. Ackley's conduct in the cabinet room generally was fascinating. He couldn't bear command or overmighty premierships and spent a good deal of his retirement warning against them. A prime minister, he said in 1961, must remember he's only the first among equals. His voice will carry the greatest weight, but you can't ride roughshod over a cabinet unless you're something very extraordinary. He was, too, the reverse of a destiny prime minister. Destiny prime ministerships nearly always end in tears. This is me, not me. In 1965, asked if he felt he was, like Churchill in May 1940, walking with destiny in July 1945 when he heard the news across the way here, we're going to be Prime Minister, Clem Attlee famously replied, no, I've not much idea about destiny. No, you see, I didn't regard myself as a potential hero. He believed in government by discussion, but as he put it in one of his all-time classic athleisms to an undergraduate society meeting in Oxford in 1957, it's only effective if you can stop people talking. <laughs> so finally, how can we sum up, tersely naturally, the legacy of Clem Attlee? Distilled to its essence, it has two chief ingredients, policy and style. As Nigel Lawson recognised in a 1988 lecture to the Centre for Policy Studies, the post-war period has been shaped by two exceptional bookend premierships. Clem Attlee's and Margaret Thatcher's. The Thatcher governments, Nigel claimed, transformed the politics of Britain, indeed Britain itself, to an extent no other government has achieved since the Attlee government of 1945-51, which set the political agenda for the next quarter of a century. The two key principles which informed its actions and for which it stood, big government and the drive towards equality, remained effectively unchallenged for more than a generation, the very heart of the post-war consensus, said Nigel. 
Now, not all of us would nowadays reach for the bundle of policies put in place either by Mr. Ackley or Mrs. Thatcher, but Nigel Lawson was right. Those two administrations were the twin weathermakers of the post-war era, which for me begins with the Labour victory of 1945 and finished with the political demise of the Thatcher government in 1990 and the ending of the Cold War. As for style, that sparse yet collegiate governing approach of Mr. Attlee's, the lack of show or any of the more absurd displacement activities that so often mark premierships these days, the insecurities, the vendettas, the occasional tantrums, and the illusions aroused by an excessive sense of personal insight and destiny, leads <laughs> in personal and process terms, make Clem Attlee's conduct of government such an enduring gold standard. When the wartime coalition broke up at the end of May 1945, against the wishes of the great warrior himself, Churchill threw a farewell party in the cabinet room. <coughs> with tears streaming down his face, he liked a good crowd in Winston Churchill. <laughs> with tears streaming down his face, he declared, the light of history will shine on every helmet. To be slightly unkind, I can't see the current coalition ending in quite such a way. <laughs> but getting back to the real thing, the wartime one, the light of history for me will always shine on Clem Attlee's helmet, as long as I'm still breathing and can hold a pen. How honoured we are to have our gold standard Prime Minister in bronze on our Queen Mary campus in his beloved East End. Thank you very much. boasts uh, not one, but, but two current serving members of the uh, uh, of Parliament. Uh, Peter, uh, newly arrived in the uh, House of Lords, and of course Tristram Hunt, uh, serving in a very distinguished way uh, in the House of Commons. So it's great to be uh, here, back at this uh, college. Obviously, um, as you can tell uh, from Peter's uh, wonderful uh, uh, lecture, um, and what a sort of wonderful, I was going to say sort of ornamental, Peter's not ornamental, he's a sort of institutional part now of the British, unwritten British constitution, <laughs> uh, on which he comments um, uh, so authoritatively. But what, of course, such a delicious uh, irony uh, that I, of all people, Herbert Morrison's grandson, <laughs> unveil, <laughs> 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 
statue of clay. <laughs> who, of course, did so much and struggled for so long and overcome, overcame so much to deny my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Overcoming leader of the Labour Party. Um, and how well he did it. Um, as, uh, as both George Jones here, Professor George Jones from the LSC, who was my grandfather's biographer, along with Bernard Donoghue, can testify, and of course Giles, uh, who wrote that wonderful uh, biography of the Athlete government, uh, the tortoise uh, and the uh, hares. Um, uh, and it's true, of course, that um, my grandfather uh, and Clem, um, um, you know, were not sort of soulmates uh, as such. But it, it just went to show that, you know, in a partnership, um, you don't have to love each other in order to make a really good and effective team, uh, as they were. And I think it also shows uh, uh, something else. Uh, when, uh, when you think of the most recent Labour government that apparently in some quarters became rather famous for its slightly sort of competing personality <laughs> at the top, that actually there have always been competing personalities in any strong government, uh, not least in Clem's government, uh, in 1945, and how strong and competing they were, but what an extraordinary achievement uh, they uh, produced uh, from, uh, uh, from their competition to see who could serve best, who could deliver most uh, for our country. And Vita um, sort of issued a sort of challenge to me to confirm or, or deny Dennis's, uh, Dennis Healy's um, uh, sort of verdict on the 19, uh, on the 4551 government when he said, you know, there were certain things they could agree on, limited but important, uh, but once they had achieved those things, uh, then their unity uh, ran out. I don't know whether that's uh, 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 true or not. I, I think there has been an enduring and existential uh, battle in our party from its foundation. Uh, between uh, revisionists and fundamentalists. Uh, it was true from the beginning, it was true in that government, and dare I say it has been, it has been true since, uh, and is true uh, uh, today. Um, my grandfather uh, was, uh, was a revisionist. He was a moderniser um, from the word go. He believed that if you didn't keep sort of thinking and revising, uh, uh, your policies and what you were going to do uh, uh, for the country, uh, then you were, uh, were at risk of becoming irrelevant or redundant and much even worse, unelectable. Um, and I think that uh, what, uh, uh, what divided my grandfather and uh, Ernie Bevy uh, was not only the personal animosity, as strong as that was, um, what really separated was that they came from two quite different wings of the Labour Party. Uh, Ernie Bevin uh, came, came from and never left the trade union wing of the Labour Party. My grandfather, in contrast, uh, came from the uh, municipal and Fabian wing uh, of the Labour Party. Uh, and although they were not irreconcilable, there were te always tensions between the two. My grandfather argued in the 20s and the 30s when he was first mayor of uh, Hackney in the 20s and then the first Labour leader of the, of the London County Council in 1934, uh, that the Labour Party could never be a sectional, trade union-based party alone and hope to be elected to national government. That was his abiding belief. He was born New Labour, <laughs> and it um, uh, uh, was absolutely uh, true. Well, uh, the early day contrast had a rather more, um, not wrong, uh, and certainly not uh, uh, a, a foundation or roots of the Labour Party that my grandfather opposed, uh, certainly not. But he never thought it was enough to make the Labour Party a national party and to be elected. Uh, 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 the national 
uh, a national uh, uh, government of our party, uh, of our country. Now, um, I think it's very appropriate that this great statue outside of Clare was first unveiled uh, by Harold Wilson. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, long before New Labour uh, was dreamt of, um, the Labour Party uh, was not renowned during the 20th century uh, for winning elections, certainly not nearly as many as our political opponents in the Conservative Party. But amidst the 20th century years of electoral uh, failure, uh, two beacons bucked uh, this trend. Um, Harold, uh, Harold Wilson, who originally unveiled the statue, uh, uh, was as leader. Uh, um, he won three elections and lost one. Uh, so he certainly bucked the trend. And the other, of course, uh, was Clement Attlee, uh, the first leader to deliver a majority Labour government uh, during the last century. And as Peter has reminded us, uh, it was Douglas J. Uh, who said of Attlee that he would never use uh, one syllable when none would do. On the only occasion I met Attlee, I didn't even get that. <laughs> <laughs> I was 12 years old. Uh, I went with my uh, father uh, uh, to Downing Street to visit our friends, the Wilsons. I think it was in 1966. Um, and I was introduced by the formidable Marsha Williams uh, to, uh, um, uh, to Lord Attlee. Marsha said, Clem, this is Peter. He's Herbert's grandson. <laughs> Clem looked up and looked and grunted and looked down. <laughs> he was admittedly getting on by now, but never was so much said. <laughs> in one grunt. <laughs> now, it, it had taken uh, Clement Attlee a decade, uh, including a world war, to get our party uh, back into uh, power after he took over the leadership in 1935, when he originally defeated my grandfather for the leadership. And my God, were we at a low ebb in 1935, crushed. Uh, by the 1931 uh, uh, Great Crash and the ensuing uh, crisis and the emergence of the national uh, government. And this was not a man uh, who became a leader who won the premiership uh, through sparkling personality. Uh, of that we know. Uh, and every profile of him mentions, as Peter has said, his terseness and almost complete absence of conversational charm. Um, Giles uh, has observed in his brilliant book that the only time Clem really became engaged and animated was when he talked about cricket. <laughs> but he had skill and he had cunning and he had guile and he had great determination all of which virtues, as you can imagine, I admire greatly, <laughs> um, aided, aided and abetted by his formidable uh, wife, uh, Vi, uh, of whom it is true when the 1945 election result was declared, and my grandfather called together his colleagues in the Woodby cabinet uh, to stop Clem becoming Prime Minister, Vi was going to have absolutely nothing of it. She bundled... Um, uh, Clem into her little Austin car, I think it was, and beetled up the Mall into the Buckingham Palace uh, uh, before these uh, uh, before these plotters uh, were able to have their, uh, to have their way. By who it was also, uh, I've always been brought up to believe as a Conservative uh, supporter, um, but this certainly didn't diminish Clem's passion uh, for social uh, justice, which had driven him and all his politics and his political beliefs and doings ever since his days as a social worker in the East End. And his government saw a staggering um, scale 
of post-war economic reconstruction, as Peter has said, and extraordinary social achievements, incomparable <coughs> social achievements. Um, the founding of the welfare state, the birth of the NHS, and the laying of the foundations of post-imperial uh, Britain. But, and this is the point I simply want to emphasize and to leave you with before I unveil this uh, with, with, with Peter, all of this extraordinary achievement done into all intents and purposes one term of government. I mean, five and a bit years. Absolutely extraordinary. The scale and the speed of that economic and that social change, uh, uh, above all, uh, um, has left an enduring progressive legacy which I don't believe has been or in all likelihood ever will be uh, surpassed uh, in, in our country. Absolutely <coughs> a remarkable world uh, of achievement. As Ben Pimlott uh, wrote, Clement Attlee has claimed the position of top deity in the modern Labour Party's pantheon. And I think it is absolutely right, therefore, that we should celebrate uh, his life and his achievements uh, as we are doing today. And it's a huge honour and pleasure for me uh, to be part of that honouring uh, of Clement Attlee. Thank you very much. when I was a very young MP for Hartlepool. And uh, I mistakenly drew back the cord. For some reason, they thought that if you had the velvet cloth here, you could just left there rested. I didn't realize, and when I opened the cloth, there was no commemorative plaque. <laughs> <laughs> because it hadn't yet been delivered. <laughs> Great roars of applause. And anyway. <laughs> simple question which has to be asked many millions of times. Uh, why was Mr. Clem chosen by the then public in favour of the late great Sir Winston after all he'd done for us, bringing us through the war from beginning to end? Well, there's a huge literature on this and Churchill's own explanation if I remember was that what trumped the gratitude of the people for his wartime leadership was the legacy of the Conservative Party as it was then perceived in the interwar years. And that legacy was hung around his neck. He was not at ease in the Conservative Party. Um, as Paul Addison once said of Winston Churchill, he was a politician without a fixed abode. <laughs> and uh, Clementine Churchill was a liberal who couldn't stand the Conservative Party. But that legacy was hung around his neck. And one of our students, who I don't think is here, found a letter in a very obscure file in the National Archives from Clem to Mr. Nehru after Indian independence, where he tried very privately to persuade Nehru not to become a republic. And of course to be in the Commonwealth, and arrangements were made for a republic within the Commonwealth. But he said, you see, in 1945, if we'd been a presidential system, Churchill would have won hands down, myself and Labour would have had no chance. And in many ways, it was, a, it was a country full of gratitude for what Churchill did, but saying, you're not, the, the gifts are not the peace. 
It rather reminds me of Douglas Hurd's wonderful line in his recent study of British Foreign Secretaries when he alludes to General Montgomery. He said, Monty was not built for peacetime. <laughs> but it, I think the electorate had a great sense, or a good part of it, that the Labour Party was built for peacetime, and so was Mr. Attlee. And the Beveridge Report, plus Keynesian economics, as we came to know it, was the key. And Michael Young, who wrote the 1945 Labour Manifesto, um, another great East End figure too, uh, once said that the key to that manifesto was Beveridge plus Keynes plus socialism, the socialism being the nationalisation. And they had uh, coherent uh, arguments. And also, the World War II collective provision had been a, a testbed for it. It's almost inconceivable now to recall how well disciplined the country was and how used it was to direction. And the greatest tribute ever paid to that was Albert Speer, not the Clement of Mendes, saying to historians in the 70s that Mr. Churchill's government and Mr. Bevin as Minister of Labour could do things with the British economy and the British people that I and the tyranny couldn't do with the German people. A huge collective capacity of the management. And all of that, I think, fed through to the electorate. But there's a great debate about which bits played and which bits didn't, and the degree to which Churchill blew it by accusing Labour of eventually sinking into Gestapo-like methods to get socialism in place, which was hugely undone. And Clement Attlee's style on the wireless, as it was then called, in that election, was a perfect antidote to all that. So who knows? It's one of those elections that's always been rerun in people's minds. But this huge 146 seat majority, which was a great surprise both to Mr. Attlee and the King, which was one of the reasons for that embarrassed silence with which I began my talk. <laughs> I, I just had one postscript to that. Uh, my, my view of 1945 is that we won such a great victory, not simply because you know, so many in the country said, as your book is entitled, Never Again. They just didn't want to go back and didn't want to return. Uh, to the state of society and condition of Britain as it had been uh, it, before the war in the 1930s and before that. But I think something also, I think that in 1945 um, we saw a temporary refusion of liberalism <coughs> and socialism. Uh, and in my view, when that sort of progressive alliance is revived, forged and presented uh, uh, to the electorate, it's formidable and unstoppable. Uh, and I think that it's something that uh, our party needs to reflect on even now, um, that uh, a, a country uh, like ours, which is sort of broadly, if not equally, divided uh, into conservatives, liberals, and socialists, when you have the liberals and the socialists working together, we outnumber and trump the Conservatives. Uh, and that is, in my view, um, a, 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 an important sort of key uh, to our understanding of, of how the electorate can think and how and the outcome that an election can have that we should think about uh, in relation to the future uh, as, well as, uh, uh, as well as the past. It's one of the reasons why, just to strike a topical and controversial note, I happen to support AV uh, as an electoral uh, uh, reform. I think it's more likely to deliver that fusion of socialism and liberalism uh, that I believe the country basically wants. I don't think the country basically wants conservatism. <laughs> <laughs> One in the middle there, first of all. Yes, I think from the, your right hand there. Uh, thank you. Is it on? I should, I should just speak loudly. Um, thank you. Uh, the topic of, of AV may come into this question. I was interested in the assessment of Clement Attlee as someone that um, may not make it to the top of politics at the moment for various presentational reasons and, and manners of style. And I was wondering whether um, either of you think there may be things that could be done constitutionally or perhaps with voting systems that might encourage us to end up with the leaders that maybe we would desire rather than the ones that we deserve. <laughs> I don't think so. I think once the television era was upon us, the, the, the game changed. And also, 
Churchill and Attlee were not alone in coming to the fore in the era of the great meetings. Um, when everybody came in, they handled hecklers and all the rest of it. And I remember, I think it was the incomparable David Butler in his study of the 1955 general election. George Jones, I remember this statistic, worked out that in those party political broadcasts, he, during the first one, if I remember, had reached more people than any previous prime minister put together had through all the face-to-face -face meetings. <coughs> and it meant that you had a different, the whole rhythm of British politics. I mean, it's hard to remember now how Harold Macmillan was thought to be the consummate politician, because he sounds so terribly mad, you know, rolling the globe in 59, doing the old statesman routine, and how fabulously effective Harold Wilson was. Um, uh, each, each generation produces a different step change. And so those leadership debates that I was being ambivalent about are just another change further. I, I think the way I would uh, comment on the question is to say that what television has brought to politics is a magnifying glass. Mm. So, um, uh, so it has brought um, a, a sort of enforced um, sort of authenticity. Uh, I'm not finding my words correctly. It's, I mean, you are seen for what you are. There's no hiding. There was a lot of hiding in politics until sort of the television age fully dawned, and even a while after that, it, it was possible to hide, but not in the internet age, it isn't possible to hide. So that you have to be authentic. Uh, there's no point uh, in trying to be something you are not. And I think the problem for the politicians, the problem arises for those politicians in the television age who try to be something else, something different. Uh, or, or, or want to sort of hide their personality, or, or are somehow afraid of this camera, or afraid uh, of this magnifying glass. You know, you have to love it, you have to embrace it, but the price you pay is that you have to be yourself in the process, uh, for good or for ill, preferably uh, or for good. Uh, uh, now, how Clem Attlee would have come out of that, in my view, is absolutely fine. Because what the magnifying glass would have discovered is a man who was not a showman, um, uh, who was not a smooth talker, uh, but who had a, a genuine sense of belief in what he stood for, and an integrity in what you said during the course of your remarks, Peter, a trustworthiness. And that's what I think the magnifying glass would have discovered. And therefore, I like to think that uh, Clem Attlee would have come out well uh, from the television uh, age, rather than to have been buried by it. Try to pass the microphone back along to Chuck in the go uh, time. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ben Rowling, chairman of Toynbee Hall, another uh, institution proud to be associated with uh, Clem Anthony. Um, as many people might know, we're sandwiched between the, the glass towers of the city uh, to our, our west and uh, the rest of the town of Hamlets to our east. And I, I often wonder um, what Clem Atley's response would have been uh, to bankers' excessive bonuses. And I wonder if either of you could throw it from that. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that um, I wasn't around uh, a couple of Saturdays ago in London. I was in the west of Ireland, but a friend of mine noticed on the television the riots, not the rioters themselves, but on the march, there were t-shirts being worn which said, what would Clem have done? <laughs> which is really quite interesting. I don't know what on earth he would have made of these bones. Well, I, I'm sure he would have disapproved of excess um, in any form. But it, it's, in, it's almost an incomprehensible world now to uh, that generation. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, he died in 1967 when what was I? I was 20. And in many ways, he'd seen, in the early post-war years, a better interwar period. Our great friend Ralph Durandorf used to say, most of British politics is designed, though he won't admit it, to creating a better yesterday. <laughs> and then, mercifully, he lived through that period when the worst of the excesses of the interwar years had been taken away. And he was still optimistic about centrally conceived schemes producing incremental benefit over a long period. We hadn't got into that scratchy pessimistic phase, when the post-war settlement, which Mr. Attlee provided, had, to be honest, fallen apart. 
uh, for a number of reasons. So what on earth he would have made today, because the distance from 1967 to now is enormous. In many ways, it's as great as the difference from, well, it is as great in some ways, from 1967 back to 1907 when he was becoming aware. Because it was Napoleon who said, if you want to understand a politician or anybody else, think of the world when he or she was 20. And Mr. Ackley and Ernie Bevan and the others, which does explain their attitude to Britain's great power, for example, came to their formation, Queen Victoria's Jubilee. And so in many ways, the compost that made Clem and Ernie and Herbert in that generation, way, way back. So heaven knows, it's impossible to know what he would have made. But I, I, one thing I am certain, the, the judgments he would have delivered would have been extremely short and to the point. <laughs> <laughs> Almost terse. <laughs> No, I think we're, what was happening in the 1960s and 70s is that banking in this country, and not just in this country, was sort of turning from uh, an era uh, which had been characterized by quality in banking, quality of financial advice, um, a, a, a quality uh, of those who acted as sort of counsellors, <coughs> in a sense, to those uh, in the corporate world, from quality to quantity. And from the, about the 1970s, and certainly all was opened and let loose with the um, big bang that Mrs. Thatcher and Andrew Lawson uh, uh, created in 1986-87, it, it, banking became about numbers. And it hadn't always been about numbers. It had previously been, as I said, not about numbers and quantity, but about quality of advice. And that's the hallmark of the great bankers of the sort of 50s and, and 60s. And that's certainly um, a kind of banking where Aki would have felt certainly more at home. Mm. Take a question down here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Councillor Rani Khan. I'm with the local councillors for Time this Council. Um, just, I mean, he sounds like a very amazing politician. And, and Peter, you said that your grandfather, um, he believed in change and this paradigm shift and evolution of politics. Um, uh, I've been involved in politics for some time, and, uh, and, and I'm quite disappointed to say that in, in mainstream politics, like, you know, you feel that you cannot sometimes speak the truth. Uh, if you have uh, differences of opinion or you want to debate, sometimes you're silenced or, or labeled or put aside. Um, I mean, my... Uh, my understanding is, and I've always been, you know, I'm, I'm a local teacher as well, that differences are healthy. Having debate is, is, is the way forward um, through understanding and so forth. Um, I mean, I take, there's a philosopher called Ghazali, and he said, if two people are debating, if one of them, uh, if either one of them is searching for the truth, then there is a point in debate. But I have felt that within, within the elitists of the parties, that you know, if you don't follow a certain pattern or you don't um, allow, uh, you know, you don't um, this like political elite who silence you from speaking the truth or ha wanting to, you know, make a real difference and a change. I mean, what would Clement Attlee say about that? Um, I mean, would he silence debate? I'm sure not. And I really do feel that um, the, the parties nowadays are moving far and far away, like they're a red shift, um, going far and far, uh, far and far out of bound with grassroots politics. And um, what would he say about um, just debate and thought, really? Well, that's difficult. I'll give you time to think. I <laughs> <laughs> probably don't need time. To... No, no, I know what I'm going to say. You go first, then. I <laughs> 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 can only improve In terms of the grass, <laughs> the grass <laughs> in terms of the grassroots, uh, Mr. Anthony had a very intimate sense, because of Limehouse, uh, of the needs of the bulk of the population. 75% of the population, 45, was members of the manual working class or their families. And he knew the essential core need to get the, the combination of factors you needed to lift people out of poverty or to have a chance of that as time went by. And the Beveridge Report gave you the blueprint, because the great genius of the Beveridge Report, which Labour seized on more effectively than the Conservatives, was that you had to hit the five giants on the road to reconstruction, as Beveridge called them, simultaneously. Otherwise, you wouldn't crack the problem. And you remember Beveridge put them in capital letters, ignorance, idleness, squalor, disease, want. Dean Duncan Smith wrote a welfare white paper which had language like that in it. He'd be offered counselling. He wrote things differently in those days. Claire had a great sense of all of that and the need to hit them simultaneously. 
if the life chances of the three quarters of the population that have been without, always been without in relative terms, were to have the slightest chance of rising. And he had that intimate feeling. I remember there's a wonderful bit in Trevor Burridge's life of Attlee, where Clem asked Jim Griffiths, the Minister for National Insurance, if he, Clem, could introduce the clause when the bill was going to the House of Commons on the death grant. A very small death grant was available to people. Because Attlee had seen how the poor died in this area, without dignity and paupers' funerals and so on. And this had really got, got deep into the strategy. And, and Jim Griffiths said, of course you can. So, in the, in the grassroots sense, even though he didn't come from this area or this background, um, actually, he had it in his bones. And so there wasn't that gap which you sense between grassroots and elite. I don't like the word elite. I mean, you're not part of an elite, are you, I think? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. No, I don't know. I'm in a retirement home. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, look, you had a mass, in those days, you had a mass party. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, my grandfather's idea of politics was as much to do with organising uh, the tremendous uh, contest amongst the socialist choirs of London, uh, together with the Friday nights of dances that would uh, take place, uh, organised by the local Labour Party or the co-op. I mean, it was a way of life. The Labour Party, whether you were dancing or singing um, or, or debating uh, or being active in your uh, community, it was a party in other words that was uh, had tremendous roots uh, in those communities it represented uh, and the voters who produced those uh, Labour Party representatives and members, whether they were in, in, in councillors or in the House of uh, uh, Commons. And it, those people, who, though, who were elected, didn't have to be of a sort of, um, a sort of identical, homogenous kind, as I'm afraid has happened uh, rather more uh, these days. Um, I don't want to labour the point, but you know, the, 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 the Labour Party of Clement Attlee's uh, uh, era had extraordinary, he was a product of what? Uh, Haynesbury? In Oxford. A private, you know, public school uh, in Oxford. Um, it didn't deny him uh, entry to the Labour Party, and it didn't deny him, as you've seen, the passions and beliefs he brought uh, to his time in public service. Um, my grandfather, in contrast, left school at the age of whatever it was, very early on, in his early, his early teens. And didn't have an opportunity. Where was it? Well, I can't remember. He didn't have an opportunity of, uh, of educated, formal education again. The Labour Party, in other words, was an extraordinarily eclectic uh, collection and range uh, of, of, of people. And I think that politics now suffers uh, from perceived that and the talent pool being far too narrow, far too uh, restricted, and the sorts of people who. Um, uh, emerge as elected representatives, and uh, I think the party, but certainly the House of Commons, uh, is uh, is a loser uh, 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 from that. Something which um, I'm sure it's not confined to the Labour Party. I'm sure in the Conservative Party, you know, you have to be a research assistant or a political advisor or, uh, or whatever it is, you know, in order to get selected. Uh, and the trade unions don't help. They tend to see sort of research assistants and political advisors as well. Um, you know, but the whole range should be far broader, deeper, more effective, as I say. Time, time is running out. I will take this one here from me in the third row. Microphone's on its way. Microphone. Actually, no. Um, at this glory days were in the post-war leadership. But uh, what was his position during the wartime cabinet? He uh, was Deputy Prime the, Minister. The War Office. Deputy Prime Minister. He was Deputy Prime Minister. He wasn't at the War Office, no. Clem. Um, he was Lord President of the Council. He ran the Home Front because Churchill got on with running the war with the Chiefs of Staff <laughs> and the Defence Committee. And he left the Home Front to come <coughs> And, 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 and your grandfather. 
My grandfather yeah. was, a, was, a home, was a home office, home secretary, particularly in London, as you know, where he was Mr. Blitz, because he liked just London. Um, uh, I'll never forget, uh, I mean, my grandfather was a Londoner, almost as much as he was anything else, and he really continued as a member of the London County Council throughout the entire time he was in the cabinet. He just wouldn't let go of it. Uh, and I remember in 1981, uh, I was a member of a local Labour Party in a general committee somewhere in Lambeth, in, in Vauxhall. And I will always remember uh, Andrew McIntosh, who was the leader of the Labour group. Um, and uh, Ken Livingstone <coughs> sent round the letter to all the constituency Labour parties in London saying that he wanted to be leader rather than Andrew McIntosh. Uh, he knew what L that London needed. He wanted to revive and recreate the spirit of Herbert Morrison in London. It's something which I found particularly appealing. I'm not sure that it made me <laughs> vote for him um, <laughs> rather than Andrew, who, who I had a lot of regard for. But I have to say that the first thing that Ken did when he arrived in County Hall in the leader's uh, room after following the election was to remove the portrait of Herbert Morrison and put it down in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's that tell us? <laughs> uh, I can't actually remember what the original question is. <laughs> One more question. Um, let's take one at the back there. Yeah. 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 He, he said that I relied on Gateskill and Wilson. He was asked this question in 1954. I don't know if Samuel Britton's here, but Sam was uh, in Jesus College, Cambridge, and I, either he or somebody else asked actually this. And he said, I didn't need to because I had Wilson and Gateskill. And Douglas J said he treated economics like medicine. He'd seek a second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a great disadvantage, particularly as the world was coming in battalions. I mean, the endless pressure on Sterling, the huge Sterling crisis of 47 the devaluation of 49, the great weight of the Korean War induced rearmament. And it is a great disadvantage in the Prime Minister not to have a feel for the arms. But he's not been the only one. I think your Tony was a bit stretched on the arms. They might have been about I don't actually agree with that. <laughs> We had a very able system. <laughs> <laughs> that seems inappropriate to uh, <laughs> finish. finish. I, I get a strong sense that we could go on for a very long time, but we could with uh, many interesting questions. Uh, reflecting, of course, the, the fascination that I'm sure you all share with me of the presentations we, we've heard this evening. And I thank uh, Peter Hennessy and Peter Mendelssohn for a terrific uh, presentation. It's been a wonderful evening. Uh, one that I hope you'll continue to enjoy with us because the next stage is that as we leave the, this building, we progress more or less straight ahead but to the right of our library, there will be stewards, directing you towards the ground coffee bar, passing as you go the statue of Clementi, which is appropriately lit for, for the evening. But then please join us in the ground coffee bar for, for a drinks reception. Thank you all very much for coming. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you.